So this is a reptile road actually. It kind of has all these little grades that twist on around here and go on around like this. And this is the 16% grade. Um, we actually made that road you know, because this was so steep. And 16% is about the angle of a cow's face. And we would go down that road. And one of the stories I wrote about in the book was my husband at the, in a truck and we, four of us were in a truck, our friends. And I'm bracing myself and I said, just go slow, just go slow. And so he starts out and, it, and he's like going like crazy. He's going like 50 miles an hour and it's bouncing off the side and it's careening and I'm worried about getting falling into that and I get to the bottom of the hill and I'm screaming at him and the bottom of this, right about here, he says to me, I said, how come you did that? Why did you go so fast? And he said, take your foot off the accelerator. <laughs> And so in my, you know, bracing myself, my foot had slipped off and it had jammed his foot onto the accelerator. And so the very thing that I was accusing him of, I was causing. So he had to turn the key off to get the truck stopped. I just, anyway. Where is Starvation Point? Well, it's not as far away as you'd think, but <laughs> it's about two and a half hours north of Bend and about two and a half hours um, east of Portland and on a very remote, at the end of a seven, you know, well, actually 11 miles of a dirt road um, along the, the John Day River. Yes. And where did the idea come from for you and your husband to, to move out there? He had been looking for a piece of property. He always thought he was born 100 years too late. I guess there are a lot of men like that around, I don't know. Um, and he always wondered if he, if he could make it and, you know, build a home, have a life, you know, that far away where he could fish and hunt and, you know, whatever. And I sort of put that off. It was like, well, it was a dream for him. And eventually um, he showed me an ad in one of those little nickel ad magazines where people sell their used washing machines and their cars. And there was a, a sale of 300 and some acres. And I was like, well, we can't, we don't need 300 acres or whatever. And he said, no, well, maybe we can split it, get him to split it. So. That's what happened, is we bought this acreage in 1979. Um, it was shortly after we'd been married, and it was also shortly after his oldest son had been killed. And I think that really, not until after we did this did we really look back and think that was one way, I think, that we were trying to grieve a, a great loss and to sort of honor his life by living fully, by not just deferring dreams that you might have because life is short. We actually came in August um, with all of our stuff. The, the shop and the uh, barn had been built in April. So by August, we were ready to go, and that's when I quit my job, and we moved up there um, in the trailers. And we started the house in, in, on October 26th, and we moved in in Memorial Day. So we were building through the winter, and it was the wettest winter they had ever had at, up to that point. So we had to do it through all of the kinds of things that you wouldn't imagine. The road got really soft because there was so much rain and the cement company didn't want to come down the road and deliver cement for the foundation of the, house, or of the shop. Actually, that was even earlier. Um, and so we had to put the cement in the back of a dump truck and drive the dump truck down and then dump it out. and. Um, I mean, everything we did there was three times more complicated than we ever would have imagined. So, first, of course, we had to design the plans and we had to get permits, many permits, um, to actually build there because we had to live, we had to build a quarter of a mile back from the river because it's on a wild and scenic river. So, there were state and federal agencies and county agencies that we had to sort of work through to get the permits. Um, and then we began with building the shop uh, where he would be able to build cabinets and other things later. So the first structure was a hangar shop, um, and that was built with a generator. Didn't have a, we didn't have any power, so um, he and his brother and another man uh, went down there to build that building. And then we brought trailers, you know, sort of a you know motorhome trailer-like uh, structures down there, and that's what we lived in. And the first thing we wanted to do was get power. Uh, and we didn't want to have to build that house with the um, with a generator, so then we had to work with the local um, power company to bring power across the river and bury it and 
you know, take it up to the shop and up to the, where the house would be. And then we wanted to get running water. We were getting tired of hauling water from town 30 miles away. And so then we started working on, and, and these are of course not sequential, that all this stuff has to be done at once. You know, and this is what, when I read old diaries about homesteaders, that is the sort of surprise of everybody's life is that there's so much that has to be done and you have to get it done like before the weather changes, you know, or before, you know, the something freezes up or whatever it might be. And so then we had to figure out how to get water and we were using a, my husband had said there was a spring there and I went and looked at this spring because there had been an old man who had who'd summered out there basically and he had a hand pump in an area. So he thought there was a spring there, and um, when we began to dig it out, it was a spring. It had lots of water, but initially, there were like dead things floating in it, and, and I was just like, there's no way we're going to get drink this. <laughs> this is what it actually looked like. Um, Twelve-foot-tall sagebrush. There was no spring, um, rattlesnakes, and the house actually goes into this ravine. That was one of the big trials, is that there was only one place we could actually build that was a quarter of a mile back from the river in order to get the permits. So, and we bought this little um, used John Deere 450B that became Deer John to me because we used that vehicle so much. Um, and we bought it in Bend <laughs> and hauled it up there and it did everything. I mean, it helped, you know, carry things around. When we moved from our um, the shop where we'd stored everything into the house, we moved the piano in the bucket of the Dear John, and so it became a a part of the family. So when you contact the the power company and say we want to get power out to this place, what what is, what do is, what do they say? Well, um, in 1964, there had been power to that property. So it had once been farmed, but there were big floods in 1964, which most of the people in the West remember um, they lived through it. And the farmer who owned, or the rancher who owned the property, just never wanted to replace it because it just flooded everything. And so there had been power there, and that, that gave us permission, basically, to re restore it. So that helped with all the permits. Um, the phone company was another sort of surprise <laughs> because I had contacted them before we moved and they said oh well when you have the ditches open for the power just call us and then we'll come in and drop the phone lines and then that'll be fine well when that happened it didn't happen and they we couldn't get the phone company to come out and finally months later um, I contacted the Public Utility Commission to find out what had happened what how because we really wanted a phone down there and so they called back after a few weeks and asked me to sit down <laughs> and said that the estimate that had been given to them by the phone company was $64,000 for a phone. And of course, that was, I just laughed, and she said, I am not kidding you. And so anyway, um, but she sent, they sent an engineer out from the phone company, and so he came up with some other options. And one was that we could bury the line ourselves. They would provide the line, and we could bury it if we would dig a ditch seven miles long and then come down over the rim rocks and the ridge. And so they delivered the wire. Um, and before we could get the big cat that we had hired to do this, it, the ground froze up. So then we couldn't do it. We had to wait till spring. So then in the spring, the big a guy with the big D8 cat came and he had a little ripper tooth on the back. And oh, we were so excited. We put a, put a pulley on it. And so he dug this ditch and the line came off, as it went into the ditch. Um, came down over the side of this ridge, which is a phenomenal ridge. Um, and then we had to bury the wire because it would bounce up. It would hit rocks and bounce up and it had to be 18 inches deep. Anyway, after all that work, um, it didn't work. There were little cuts in the wire all the way along. We don't know whether it was the wire was defective or whatever, but um, so we had to do it again. And I called the engineer after the first disaster, and I said, you know, what's going on? What's that? Wally, what are we going to do? And he said, common sense will prevail. And I thought that meant, you know, they would get it fixed. But he, to him it meant, you will do it over. <laughs>
you mentioned one of the things that was built was a, a hangar. Yeah. Why was a, a hangar built on the property? So after we found this property in 1979 and, and we went down that road, um, and I'm thinking, well, what happens if the weather is really bad? And you know, I didn't want to be on that road. When those ruts were made by water running, you know, and digging that, those ruts out. And so my husband said, well, why don't we get our um, pilot's license? We'll find an airplane, we'll get our pilot's license, we'll build a hangar, and then we can land there. And if the weather's really bad on the road or up on top, we'll just fly out of that. And so we bought this airplane and... Um, and we initially kept it not in the hangar at all because we didn't have an airstrip yet. We kept it in a little town called Wasco, which was about 23 miles away from the ranch. And it had a, an airport there, a state-owned airport, and we just tied it down there. And um, I took it a couple times to work, and we did some other things with it, um, but we didn't ever actually... Um, we didn't have to use it to get out because we didn't have it there to get out. So anyway, my, the friends who helped us with the phone line the second time, um, they came up in the spring of 1987, I think it was, um, to uh, celebrate, basically. And uh, we decided to go do our biennials. When you have a pilot's license, every two years you have to go and fly with an instructor and make sure you still know how to do everything. So we both did that on this day, and they were passengers in the back of the plane. And we were coming back from uh, La Grande, Oregon, and going to land in Wasco. And as we came in over the town, it was an uphill strip, so it was it was considered somewhat a hazardous strip. But it was paved, and you had to go over the town and then land uphill. And I told my friend in the back seat, who was seven and a half months pregnant, you know, we're going to go over these trees, and there'll be a little sink, but after that, we'll be just fine, because we were right at the end of the runway. It was like the the bottom of the exclamation point is where we were for the strip. And suddenly the sounds all changed. The, the engine was still going, but um, something had changed. And my husband was doing things frantically over here, and I'm, we're sort of starting to drift. And I said, you know, they're, Jerry, the trees, because I could see us coming closer, the trees over here. And, and then I heard the, the locust trees, sort of real branches underneath on the fuselage. It was like being on a boat in a lake where you can hear the reeds under it. And I still thought we could make it. Um, but then the wind clipped a spruce tree, and so it just pitched us forward. Um, I don't remember coming towards the ground. I just remember light. I thought, this is it. And after all this work, this is it. We're going to die. Um, my husband didn't think that. He was still trying to fly it, and, uh, and I think he did the best that we could do. But we did crash. We missed three houses uh, in the middle of the town. We missed all the power lines, um, and there was no fire. So all of these things were gifts. The two of us had a lot of broken bones, but our friends in the back, um, she doesn't have any memory of it, which is wonderful. Um, she went into labor, but they were able to stop the labor. Um, and the baby was born full term, you know, seven, six weeks, seven weeks later. And we recovered, um, but the airplane never did recover. All the local people came up and, you know, they helped us out. And then afterwards they came out and they did work on the ranch for us. and. Um, had a big harvest day where the women brought food and the men were putting in the irrigation system that we'd been trying to get set up. Um, we hadn't been on the property very long when this thing happened. And One of the ranchers came up to us. We were sitting on the deck with our legs and casts and our, this is what we, this is what we look like. And we were sitting on the deck and he said, how are you doing? He was real cheerful. And I said, well, not so good. You know, we didn't expect other people to get caught up in our adventure here, you know, and I said, here are all these people, half of them we don't even know, and we'll never be able to pay this back, and and he said, oh, Jane, you missed the point. He said, we love doing this, and you give to us when you let us, and he said, you're right, you'll never be able to pay this back. They were killing rattlesnakes in the ditches and all sorts of stuff. He said, the best you can hope to do is pass it on. The other health scares while you were um, Through the years, yes. Um, my husband had uh, uh, got bladder cancer, and we had some complications with that. He, um, everything, you know, he we had some he had some problems with what we didn't know what it was, but he was getting sicker and sicker, and he didn't want to go to the doctor. And finally, I, I he did, he just had a lot of pain, abdominal pain, and so um, 
I find, we got the ambulance and they came down and um, and then they said I said I'd really like an airlift back to Bend. Bend was our sort of our home base. We we kept our doctors here and um, and our dentists continued to be here and things even though it was two and a half hours away, which isn't unusual. There are a lot of people in that region who would travel to Portland or travel south to Bend. And, but anyway, we, he was airlifted out and he had actually had a, a his colon had burst. And so he had you know, emergency surgery, and, and it seemed like every other year there was something major going on for him. Um, and, that, and so in 2010, when it was getting close to the odd-numbered year when it was always really bad for him, um, that's when I started pushing for, you know what, you know, I think the time has come for us to maybe be a little bit closer than you know, 45 minutes or an hour by air. Um, I'd rather that we could drive to the hospital in 20 minutes or something like that. So that's when we moved and made the decision to leave the ranch. How long had you been at the ranch at this particular point? 27 years. Yeah, 27 years. One of the insights over this time period that I've come with is that if you think about intelligence as being a clock face, you know, instead of digital, with 12 o'clock being really, really smart, and then 3 o'clock would be kind of smart, and 6 o'clock would be average intelligence, and 9 o'clock would be kind of dumb, and 11.59 would be really, really dumb, but it's right next to really, really smart. <laughs> and sometimes in life, you can't tell whether it's the smartest thing you've ever done or the stupidest thing you've ever done, and you can't tell it until after you've gone through it, you know, after you've sort of survived it. And, and for us, you know, for me personally, I think it was the smartest thing I ever did. I would do it again. I think I would, I, I would like to believe that I would be, have been less obsessive about when things went wrong. It seemed like it took me a lot of maturing time to let go and not be so anxious about whatever's going to be the next trial. And in some ways it was in writing the book and looking back that I sort of thought, oh, you know what, that was a terrible time and I got through it. Oh, that was a terrible time and I got through it. Um, but yes, I, I remember there was a day, this was after the um, airplane accident and probably a year or so after it. And, and my husband and I used to like to go to dance and um, my foot had been pretty badly damaged in the accident and had lots of pins in it. And he had broken his, both of his ankles and his hip and, and we'd been a wreck um, with, in casts and so on. And so this was about maybe seven or eight months afterwards and it was a gorgeous day and the sun was out and um, I was dusting and he was sitting in the chair with his blue coveralls on and, and there was a song by um, Linda Ronstead and um, oh, was, oh, not C.C. Winan, but one of the Winan brothers and it was, I don't know much but I know I love you. And he said to me, hey, you know, if you finish dusting that stuff, I might like to dance with you and I said, well, if I finish dusting this, that song will be over. <laughs> and so he said, yeah, I thought you might say that. So he sort of stood up and he took my little lemon pledge, you know, pad. And, um, and we started to dance in the living room. And the dogs were kind of spread around looking at what's going on here. And, and we had to readjust, you know, because my foot didn't work right. And his hip didn't work right as, as the way we had danced before. And I thought to myself, but that's what living is about. You make adjustments, you change what you're doing, and, and that's part of what living looks like. And as we sort of moved around the dance, you know, the living room floor, and I looked out, and we didn't have any drapes because we had no neighbors, <laughs> and I saw the vineyard that we had planted, and um, I saw the river, and I thought to myself, and I said to him, I could not be happier in my life than I am at this moment, and I almost passed it up. You know, I almost didn't do it because I was so afraid. And so for that moment alone, I am grateful and I would do it again.